Good morning, everybody. I nearly said good afternoon there. I was getting carried away with myself. So apologies. I'm just going to share my um, screen with you, if you can bear with me. Hopefully you can see um, my screen. Yeah, let's go for it then. Um, I will I'll re rely on the fact that somebody somewhere will shout at me if things don't look as they ought to. So first of all, I would love to say that I really am delighted to be back with you today. The feedback from last year, um, where I know we were at a time where everybody had had a really difficult time and it felt very much like everybody just needed to be given permission to feel like they were feeling and that somehow everybody felt like um, they were the outlier if they weren't coping particularly well after the difficult year we've had. And now this year, it feels like people feel the same, but for different reasons. So last year, it was all about lockdown. This year, a lot of it is actually about re-entry, as they're calling it, where we're coming out of lockdown and back into the world that we once knew, but that's very different. So I'm going to talk about moving from anxiety to optimism. And um, the first thing that I would like to say to every delegate that's here in the audience is you are here for a reason. There was something about this day, this session that appealed to you that you thought I can get some benefit from this. The biggest enemy to getting anything out of this session is going to be your other online activities, checking your emails and so on. So I would just say to you, it's only half an hour. Give yourself over entirely to the session that we've got and see what you can get out of it. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to do, which will help you get the best that you can out of this, is to choose one of the following four options that you think most accurately describes intelligence. This is about mindset. And mindset is something which helps shape us as human beings. So the four options, and if you're familiar with the work of Carol Dweck, these will be familiar to you, are your intelligence is something very basic about you that you can't change very much. You can learn new things, but you can't really change how intelligent you are. No matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change quite a bit. Or you can always substantially change how intelligent you are. Now, I'm just going to ask you not to share this publicly, but just to think for yourself which you think is true. I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Maybe reread the options. And when you've done that, I want you to think about why you might have arrived at that decision. Because I'm going to tell you that if you answered anything less than four, I would suggest there might be some room for improvement. Because if you picked number one, for example, your intelligence is something very basic about yourself that you can't change very much. I would just urge you to look at the last 18 months and look at what you have learnt. Now, intelligence is nothing more than the acquisition of knowledge and skills and the application of those knowledge and skills. We have learned a whole new vocabulary. We've learned different ways of living. Now, that means that we can change our intelligence because we're all more intelligent in some way or another than we were 18 months ago. And you're all more intelligent in the job that you do than you were a year ago. Number one is really limiting. It suggests that you're quite a fixed individual. Whereas number four, which is where I suggest most of us ought to be, we can always sustain, uh, sorry, substantially change how intelligent we are, is in my experience, the truth. But the problem we have is if we don't believe it, then it won't be true. Because if you believe you can't be much more intelligent than you are, with intelligence just being the acquisition of knowledge and skills and the application of the same, then you won't change very much. But if you believe you can, you will. And the beauty of this information and the reason I'm talking about this when I'm talking about anxiety is because actually, if you feel that you can't change and adapt, you're much more likely to be anxious. Because if you know you can change and adapt, then you know that anything thrown at you is something that it might not come instinctively or instantly, but you can get there. So if you're thinking that maybe one, two or three was your answer. Just have a little think again and ask yourself, how many times have you learned new things and then been able to thrive as a result of that? So we're talking about anxiety. What is anxiety? First of all, we all experience it. It is a feeling of unease. It's something that you can't necessarily put your finger on, but you know it's there. It may entail worry, fear, tension, and it can be mild to severe. 
It's often about what will or may happen. And the may happen is really important because anxiety can be about not something that's staring you in the face, but something you're predicting might stare you in the face. It can be experienced in physical sensations. So you can actually feel an upset stomach or a headache, or it might be in the thoughts that you have. But crucially, and this is so important, we're in a world now where thankfully the dialogue about mental health and mental illness has expanded, but that has led us to use some terms interchangeably and incorrectly. Anxiety is not a diagnosis. It is a perfectly natural human experience. So when people say I suffer from anxiety, that might be correct, but that is not necessarily the same thing as having a mental health condition, which anxiety is a factor of. So if you feel anxiety and you've heard all these people talking about experiencing anxiety and suffering from anxiety, don't feel that that is in some way a weakness. It is not. Anxiety is a normal human experience. And our mission today is to explore when is it a problem and crucially, what are we going to do about it? So when is it a problem? First and foremost, when it's affecting your day to day life. And that means that all of a sudden, or maybe not all of a sudden, maybe you've experienced it for some time. And of course, I'm very much aware that this presentation for some of you might be less about what you feel, and it might be about you wanting to support other people in your life. And that's absolutely fine, because the more you understand about anxiety, the more you can help people who might be experiencing it. So anxiety is a problem when it affects day to day life, and you don't feel you can carry on day to day life as you would have done. When the severity or frequency exceeds your tolerance levels, so it might be so severe you feel kind of crippled by it, or it might be happening so often that you feel that it's a real detriment to your life. When you kind of get anxiety out of proportion, and you can see other people seem to be coping with things reasonably well, although word of caution on that, how people seem to be coping and how they are coping can be very different things. So are you getting things out of proportion? And if those things are something that you're experiencing, just remember that anxiety is very treatable. Normally, first and foremost, um, psychological therapies would be looked at. And if that doesn't work, maybe combination therapy with drug and psychological therapies. And some people have what's called a looming cognitive style. And that just means that if something might happen, you might begin to feel it as if it's really actually happening. So let's take the example of some money disappears out of your bank account and you go into a blind panic and all of a sudden you can feel it coming towards you as if it's really happening and you experience all the feelings in your body and the sensations as if it's happening and you're living that as if you're in the moment that the worst you can imagine is happening in that moment when in fact the worst that you can imagine isn't happening at all. All that's happened is an unexplained or an ambiguous event, and you don't know what's happening. But this looming cognitive style is when that becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and it feels like you're there in the moment. And a looming cognitive style is something that it's well worth trying to get a grip on because you're getting carried away with something that's not actually happening. And one thing that can really help with that is reminding yourself how much you can control. Because if we fall into the danger zone of believing that other people or other events control our mood state, that's extremely disempowering. What we need to remember is we control our mood state. In large part, we control our mood state. Now, very quickly, just in case one of these might be applicable to you or you want a bit more information, there are diagnoses associated with anxiety. And the numbers next to each one are how many people in the UK suffer from these conditions in a week in the UK on average. So mixed anxiety and depression, eight in 100 people will experience them. So now start thinking about how many people are in this virtual room and how many people you know. If eight in a hundred in an average week are experiencing it, when you get to the bottom of this list, you will know somebody who is experiencing a diagnosis associated with anxiety. And crucially, it's not fixed. If you have one of these things, you don't experience it all the time, every week, all year long. 
people move in and out, which means that really even more people than this suggests are experiencing these things. Generalised anxiety disorder would be six in 100. Post-traumatic stress disorder, a major feature of which is anxiety, it would be four in 100. Phobias are all about anxiety of something or other, two in 100. Obsessive compulsive disorder, one in 100. Panic disorder would be less than one in 100. And social anxiety disorder at the time of print, there were, there were no numbers available for this. So when we talk about anxiety, that's the normal human condition. When we talk about these diagnoses associated with anxiety, then that's something which is a diagnosed mental health condition. And something which is prevalent for a lot of people is this re-entry anxiety. Now, re-entry is the term that's being used about coming out of lockdown and getting back into society, maybe going back to work. And what I would say is that for some of you listening, you might be thinking, well, crikey, we've done that. That was months ago. But believe me, there are lots of people out there who really haven't done that yet, who are still working from home, whose companies are still saying they need to work from home, who are not socialising as they were previously, and who are suffering from an anxiety specifically about re-entry to the world. Now, most of the stuff we'll talk about is applicable whether your anxiety is general anxiety or specifically about re-entry. But these things in particular for people concerned about re-entry will be things that may be bothering them. So should I go to that event? Should I be with unvaccinated people? And if not, how do I manage that? Have people in my home? Do I want people in my home? Or do I have to actually say, no, I can't have people in my home because I'm too worried about the implications of that? What are the risks for my family members? Can I still wear a mask even though I'm not required to wear a mask? And as happened to me when I first went to an event after lockdown, what if they blow out the candles on the birthday cake? Do I want to be around that? Do I want to eat the birthday cake? When I hold a birthday party, what will I do about that? These are things that people are not handling because they haven't thought about them in advance. So when you've got an event coming up, if you can just try and think, well, what's coming? How do I need to prepare myself? What am I going to do with it? I do apologise. I've got a postman at the window waving at me, so I'm just waving back at him. So when we think about anxiety, we need to think ahead. That's our best strategy. And then we're going to look at some specific steps that will help us through any anxiety we might be feeling. And the first step is acceptance. Now, I don't know about you and, and how you found lockdown and how you're finding things now, or actually how you find all sorts of things you might have anxiety with. But acceptance is absolutely the first step to dealing with anxiety. You don't have to like the way the world is. You don't have to like the way your employer is dealing with it. You don't have to like any of those things, but you do need to accept them as they are. Because the longer you don't accept them, the more you're battling with something that is a futile waste of your time. Now, for those of you that joined us last year, or even if you've maybe seen a clip that was shared about this event, you may have seen this. And this is the invaluable tool that will help you understand what do I have to accept and what can I do something about? So these three circles were developed by an author called Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he said that in order to deal better with our world, we need to work out what's in our circle of control, which is the inner circle, what's in our circle of influence, the middle circle, and what's in our circle of concern. So it's all very well for me saying to you, you need to accept things as they are. But what do you need to accept? And what can you do something about? Well, the inner circle, the green circle, is your circle of control. That's the stuff you can really do something about. And I make no apologies for repeating this this year, even though we covered it last year, because often we need a reminder, and it is the foundation and the cornerstone of our well-being, in my opinion. So our circle of control is this, my actions, my reactions. That's all I can control. The next circle out is our circle of influence. That's the stuff where I can actually influence other people, and that may be beneficial to the situation that I find myself in. 
So when I talk about influence, it might be that you can influence how your friends and your family behave. It might be that you can influence how your boss wants you to return to the office or the precautions that are taken at work. You can't directly make them happen, but you can influence them. And then the third circle, the outer circle, that's our circle of concern. That's the stuff we really can't do anything about. And I actually refer to that as my circle of acceptance rather than my circle of concern. Because once I've identified that I cannot do anything, I can't control it, I can't influence it, I just have to accept it, I know where to put my energy. And my energy is not worth being spent on something I cannot change. So, for example, the fact there is a global pandemic, the fact there is a fuel crisis, the fact that there are so many things going on in the world that we're uncomfortable about, if we can't change them, but we can accept them, then we can move our energy into what we can control and what we can influence so that we can be an active agent in making things the way we want them to be, or at least experiencing them the best way we possibly can. Step two, avoid avoidance. If you're anxious about something, the worst thing you can possibly do is to avoid it, because if you avoid it, the fear gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more overwhelming. So let's take re-entry as an example. If you're avoiding going into certain situations because they make you anxious, if there's a really good reason for that, that's fine. If you've really risk assessed it and decided, no, that doesn't work for me, that's okay. But if actually it's just a fear of something that may happen that there isn't really a genuine concern about, that avoidance is really unhealthy because you will continue to move away from that thing and allow the fear to grow. Our step three is that we could ask ourselves what could go right. Unfortunately, if you tend to be quite anxious, and I'm going to hold my hands up and say I am one of those people, I find fear in many things. I anticipate, in one way, it feels like a blessing because I anticipate what might go wrong and then I try and avoid it. But that gets out of hand when you start to imagine things that never happen and that you then think about the next step and the next step and the next step. And before you know it, your head is clouded with a thousand anxieties and worries, which if you were to revisit them in a week's time, never happened, were never going to happen. So if you do have that slightly anxious style, what you might find yourself doing is saying, what could go wrong? And then that's my reason for not doing it. But what I would ask you to do is when you're looking at that box of possibilities, think of that image and ask yourself, not could go, or what could go wrong, but what could go right? And the sorts of things that could go right are numerous. You might meet somebody you didn't expect to meet. An opportunity might present itself that you didn't expect. You might just simply enjoy yourself. You might be exposed to things that have been long in your past and you suddenly remember how important they were to you. And certainly if during lockdown you found that some of the joy went out of your life, but now you feel that coming back into the world, you're anxious about things for, for good reason, then you now need to think about, well, okay, what could go right if I were to do this? And you might start asking yourself, apologies, you might start asking yourself things like, what have I missed? Is it good company? Is it good food? Is it live music? And then can I expose myself to those opportunities in a way that feels safe for me and that I know there will be something good in it for me? But it's a process. It's not something you want to necessarily throw yourself wholeheartedly into immediately and, and then find that it was all a bit too much. It's something you want to do gradually in a way that you find works for you. And just ask what could go right. And then there's something that a lot of people are experiencing, which is social anxiety. Now, a, a lot of people experience social anxiety well before we came into the pandemic. But now, having been out of circulation for a lot of time and living our lives from kind of here up, more and more people are experiencing social anxiety. And again, when I talk about social anxiety, I'm not talking about social anxiety disorder. I'm not talking about diagnosed mental health conditions that you need specialist support for. I'm talking about situations where you might be walking into an environment and you just feel like you're not quite sure that you're going to be okay. And that can feel a lot like that. 
that can feel like maybe everybody is going to be looking at me. It can feel like maybe you're not going to know the right thing to say. It can feel like people might be looking at you a bit oddly. It can feel like maybe you've just forgotten the art of conversation or that nothing sits right. You've been at home in your tracksuit for so long that getting dressed up feels like an odd thing to do and everything feels a little bit artificial. And that's something which can become quite overwhelming. And again, when we talk about avoidance, this is something people avoid doing. They don't want to get back into these social situations. But it's so well worth getting back into the social situations because we as human beings are social creatures. In our DNA, we're programmed that if we feel isolated, that is something that we experience as a bad thing. Because historically, going back generations and generations to our ancestors and prehistoric times, if we felt isolated, if we wandered away from our tribe, we were in danger. And so now that's hardwired into us. If we feel isolated, that comes with real negative, both mental and physical health conditions. Loneliness and isolation have about the same negative health impact on you as smoking. That's a massive statistic. So if you feel that you're avoiding social situations because you don't feel comfortable with them anymore, ask yourself, what can I do about that? And the answer is you can plan and prepare. And think about the art of conversation. We're so used to taking the blame for everything, aren't we? We tend to hold ourselves responsible for everything. So when we get into a situation where it is a social situation, and all of a sudden it feels like the conversation doesn't go very well. Even in an interview, we can do this. And we tend to think, well, that interview didn't go well. I must have been terrible. It takes two to tango, people. You know, we actually don't live in a vacuum we're not all on our own and if we're going into a conversation at work or socially we need the other person to play ball with us we need to relax and breathe into the space that we're in it's only a conversation it's not a performance and maybe a good thing to do is to share your concerns you will often find that if you say crikey I feel a bit out of sorts with this this feels quite alien to me now The person that you're talking to will often feel the same. In a survey of 900 people that was done as we were coming out of lockdown, the statistics were that 37% of people were looking forward to coming out of lockdown. 36% were not looking forward to coming out of lockdown. So over a third of people were not looking forward to it. The chances that you'll end up getting in a conversation with somebody in the same position is quite high. And then the remainder didn't feel strongly either way. And when you have a conversation, and I would say this is a lesson for life, this is not just a lesson if you experience anxiety, is when you're talking to somebody, really listen to understand them. What we tend to do is get a kind of performance anxiety and think, right, I must be ready ready with my witty retort or be ready to say something interesting. Actually, what the person you're talking to really wants you to do is to listen to them to be able to sense that you understood what they were saying. And then of course you formulate your response. But if that response is on the tip of your tongue because really all you've thought about all the time they're talking is what you're gonna say next, that isn't a good feeling. And you may think of times where that's happened to you. If you're worried about going into these situations, prepare a list of questions to ask. Now I'm not suggesting that that list of questions is you walking in with a notebook, but just think, what would I say? And then really importantly, what will I respond if they ask me? Because that's how conversations are supposed to flow. And if that person doesn't ask you any questions, that's not your fault. So don't beat yourself up about the fact that a conversation is sometimes not great, but not because of you. Crucially, If you feel anxious about social situations, and this was one of the highest areas of anxiety when people were surveyed, I think 46% of people said that their biggest concern was that social anxiety. Put the spotlight elsewhere. Stop worrying about yourself and how you look and how you sound and if you're the one coming across as intelligent. And instead, put the emphasis on the other person of really listening, of really understanding, of showing empathy to them of being the person they want to be in conversation with because the spotlight is on them. And these are all things that help with the art of conversation and relieve your anxiety about social situations because suddenly it's not really about you anymore. It's about them. And that is the best sort of person to have a conversation with. 
Our step five is to seek progress, not perfection. Some of us are really hard on ourselves. And if we are coming through an anxiety, it might be because we're doing something for the first time, or it might be because we have a fear of failure that other people might observe us doing something wrong. We should always be about progress and not perfection because success is an iterative process. It takes time to get to perfection. But those of us with some perfectionist tendencies, again, hand held high, we don't like that feeling because if we like to be a perfectionist, if we think that's important, then we don't like other people seeing our weaknesses. And that can stop us trying new things. That can cause us to feel anxious. But if we want to be optimistic about the world, we have to have faith that people aren't looking to wrap us for the wrong things. What they want to do is see us succeed eventually. And anybody with a good head on their shoulders knows this is a process. And we're really good at this with kids. I want you all to think of a time when you have seen a baby learn to walk. Maybe it was one of your own children. That might take you to a happy place, even better, because a good frame of mind is going to take you to a, a more positive frame of mind. I do apologise. My laptop has just leapt on on its own. So thinking of that baby learning to walk and everybody stands around and they watch the baby shuffle and then get up on its feet, maybe hold on to something, take the first few steps and then it flops back down and it's all over. Does everybody clap and cheer? Yay, well done, that was brilliant. Of course they do, because they understand that that process is part of getting to the success. But as adults, what we do instead is say, actually, it didn't work. You might as well give that up as a bad job. Don't bother trying that again. We would never do that to a baby through all their learning experiences because we understand that it's about progress, not about perfection. So we need to cut ourselves a break and do the same. So how do you adjust your approach? Accept that perfection is an illusion. I don't care what you see on social media. It's an illusion. Three pictures a day from somebody is not their life. And that creates a barrier because we think, well, if they can do it like that, we should do it like that. When we're thinking about things like re-entry, we need to ask ourselves questions like, if not now, when am I going to do it? When am I going to feel ready? Because I would venture that while it's still very scary times and I do not minimise the fear that a lot of people have at the moment, I'm a risk averse person myself. But if not now, when? Is this the way you want to live your life for however long this may continue? Or are you prepared to accept that there are lots of steps you can take to minimise the risks, but that avoidance is not the answer? And that when you go back into the world, you might not get it right first time. But if you can be open and honest about that and accept progress over perfection, there is a way forward. Do you have reasons for not doing things? If you do, don't do them. That's great. Or are you making excuses? Can you accept that mistakes are OK? Do things like mindfulness, like grounding yourself, like being grateful. So you might be grateful for something as simple as, I don't want to go back and live the life that I lived before, but I'm grateful I've got the opportunity. So let's not talk about moving back to the old ways, going back to how things were. Let's think about moving forward to a better way where we retain all those things we enjoyed from lockdown, but we embellish them with all the stuff that we loved pre-lockdown and we create our own futures. We are an active agent in what that looks like. And you can do things like, I'm not going to ask you to do it now, but you can tense everything in your body for 10 seconds and then relax and repeat because that is a really good way to physically get the anxiety out of your body. And then I'm going to leave you with my final step, but we've still got a couple of slides to go after that. And my final step is to say, well, OK, we've talked a lot about what's in here, about your attitude, about your mindset, about how you can think about things differently. But now I'm going to think about what's out there. There is so much out there. And a serendipity mindset can really help you with that. And this was uh, this is something that I picked up from a book called The Serendipity Mindset, The Art of Creating Good Luck by a Dr. Christian Bush. And he says that in our lives, we experience unplanned moments. And with those unplanned moments comes unexpected good luck very often. And from the unexpected good luck, if we make some proactive decisions we can end up with positive outcomes. And I'm going to give you one quick example of that in my life. I 
uh, left my last job five years ago to start my own business. And I thought, well, every job I've had has been project management. So I'm going to go into project management. I loathe project management. I hate it. And then somebody came to me and said, you used to work for us. We've got a gap for our training. Will you come and be our freelance trainer? And I thought, why did I not think of that? That's what I love doing. No, I've never had a job title that included it, but that's what I love. That's my passion. So I made a proactive decision and I became a freelance trainer and they have been the best five years in my professional life that I've ever had. So that was a massively positive outcome. And I think most of you, if you look back in your life when you've experienced an unplanned moment with some unexpected good luck and then did something proactive, you became the active agent, you will find that you've had positive outcomes. But sometimes we don't see the moments. Sometimes we're so busy, stuck in the anxiety, we're not noticing the opportunities. And then we don't recognize the good luck or make the proactive decisions to get the positive outcomes. So think about times when that's worked for you and then look to explore where you can find them some more. And then I would also say that as we come to the end of the presentation, a couple of thoughts to leave you with. The first thing is, I love this quote. It's from John Kabat-Zinn, who's the kind of father of modern day mindfulness. And he says, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. And with anxiety, it comes in waves, but you can surf it with all the hints and tips that I've suggested to you. You can learn to surf the waves and come towards optimism. And something like the serendipity mindset, that's a real optimistic mindset because it's showing that you realistically believe that there is reason to be optimism because there's opportunity there. You just have to be spotting it and connecting the dots. And finally, I would say that there is a belief and there's a saying that knowledge is power. And actually, I really fundamentally disagree with that. On this whole day of talks that you're having today, you will gain lots and lots of knowledge. But the power will come when you apply that knowledge. When you think back to that growth mindset and say, yes, I can do something different. Knowledge is not power. The application of knowledge is power. And that is what can take you from anxiety to optimism and hopefully to every day be in a slightly better day, full of less avoidance, full of more progress, not perfection. <laughs>